This film is a project of the Leonor Annenberg Institute for Civics in partnership with the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands. Citizenship is every person's highest calling. This is a film about the right of a defendant to confront any witness who testifies against him in a criminal trial. That right comes from the Sixth Amendment, and we're going to get to the Sixth Amendment in a minute. But first, a little story. Sir Walter Raleigh was one of the giants of the British Empire. Under the first Queen Elizabeth, Raleigh's company explored the New World, introduced tobacco to England, and landed the first English settlement in America. The settlement didn't last, but the capital of North Carolina is named after Walter Raleigh. After Queen Elizabeth died, Raleigh did not get along with King James I, who put him on trial for treason. He was charged with treason and put in the Tower of London. That was kind of a seminal moment uh, for the English courts. Raleigh's life was at stake, but the main evidence against him was a piece of paper signed by Lord Cobham saying he and Raleigh plotted against the king state never made Cobham come to court, and Raleigh said that Cobham's signed testimony was a lie. He cried foul and said, bring my accuser face to face so I can ask him questions. Tell him to say it in open court. There were no live witnesses in the courtroom. Uh, and he famously said, don't I have a right to confront my accusers? Raleigh was convicted and sentenced to death. Britain's great explorer was beheaded without ever getting the chance to face his accuser in court. The trial actually was considered a farce at the time, and when the founders were uh, coming up with the constitutional rights that were important for them, this was one of the things that was on their minds when they wrote the Confrontation Clause. The word confront is in the Sixth Amendment, so people have the right to be confronted by witnesses against them. Right here in the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution, it says in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him. This is known as the Confrontation Clause. The premise of the Confrontation Clause is that the criminal defendant has a right to confront the witness against him. If someone is going to testify against you, you have the right to challenge that person right there in court. The core purpose of uh, cross-examination is to test the government's case and to test their witnesses and to show the jury that there are problems with what's being said. The Confrontation Clause is a way of leveling the playing field a little bit between the government and a criminal defendant. Before the government can lock you up or take your life, its witnesses have to come to court to answer your questions. But it's not always so simple. In practice, it's very complicated. Take the case of the Crawfords. August 1999 in Olympia, Washington. Sylvia Crawford told her husband Michael that a man named Kenneth Lee tried to rape her. Drugs and drinking were involved, and nobody knows what's true, but instead of going to the police, the Crawfords went to Kenneth Lee's apartment. The two men got into a fight, and Michael Crawford stabbed Kenneth Lee in the stomach. The police took Michael and Sylvia to the station and put them in separate interrogation rooms to try to find out what happened. Michael's core defense was self-defense. Michael told the police that he and Kenneth Lee had a fight, that he saw Lee reach for a weapon, so he had to stab Kenneth Lee in self-defense. If he had a knife and came at Michael, then Michael had the right to defend himself with all force necessary. But there was a problem with Michael's story, and the problem was Sylvia. In another room, she told the police that Kenneth Lee didn't have a weapon. That confirmed Lee's side of the story, and it meant that Michael would have a hard time claiming in court that he acted in self-defense. Michael Crawford was charged with assault and attempted murder. Self-defense was his only chance. It would completely make Michael's defense if he could establish that Kenneth either was or appeared to be armed, and Sylvia's statement suggested that he wasn't. And that was the critical issue in the case, because Michael Crawford wasn't contesting that he had stabbed Kenneth Lee. What he was claiming in his trial was self-defense. And therefore, at trial, what the prosecution was hoping to do uh, to defeat this defense of self-defense was to present the wife. But the wife in this case, Sylvia, wasn't going to testify against her husband. Making a spouse testify against another spouse was a violation of Washington state law. Spousal privilege really goes back uh, a long time in our history. 
The idea was that you would strengthen the institution of marriage by not having couples be able to testify against each other in court. When a defendant claims self-defense, it's pretty much guaranteed that he's going to testify at the trial because he has to tell the story about what happened. So Michael Crawford was going to tell his story at trial. Now, if Sylvia then took the stand and gave a version of events that was different, that really would have undermined his story, really critically undermined his claim of self-defense. Without Sylvia's testimony, it was Michael's word against Kenneth Lee's. That was better for Michael's case, but not so good for the prosecution. The prosecution had a real problem because there was Kenneth Lee, there was Michael Crawford, but in terms of someone to break the tie about what happened, they were at a loss. So what they did, instead of calling Sylvia Crawford at the trial, was they sought to introduce tape recordings. Back at the police station on the night of the stabbing, Sylvia gave the police a statement that she didn't see Kenneth Lee reach for a weapon. At Michael's trial, since state law wouldn't allow Sylvia to take the stand, the prosecution replaced Sylvia with Sylvia's statement. The judge said that was okay, and Michael Crawford was convicted of assault and sentenced to 14 years in prison. So one day I read the Washington Supreme Court's nine to nothing opinion in a case called State versus Crawford, and a few things jumped out at me. This is Jeffrey Fisher. Fisher was a young lawyer who had clerked for Justice John Paul Stevens. He had just moved to Seattle when he read about the Crawford case in the news. This should be an absolutely easy case that Michael Crawford should win hands down. He felt so strongly about it, he did something that changed the course of history. He picked up the phone. I picked up the phone and called his lawyer, and I said, if you'd like me to do a petition to the Supreme Court to hear your case, I'd be happy to do it. Jeff Fisher was so happy to do it, he took on Michael Crawford's case for free. Cases like Michael Crawford's case that should have been easy under any, any sensible understanding of the Confrontation Clause were again and again coming out wrong. Okay, we'll come back to the Crawfords in a few minutes, but first, let's take care of some business. Our Constitution sets up an adversarial system of justice. The prosecution or the government is on one side, the defense on the other. Both sides get to make their best argument with a judge to make sure the rules are followed and a jury of citizens to decide the verdict. Much of the process for conducting our criminal trials is right there in the Sixth Amendment. There are two big ideas at the heart of the Sixth Amendment. One is the jury trial idea. A second idea underlying the Sixth Amendment is just fair courtroom procedures in a criminal prosecution. The guarantees of the, of the Sixth Amendment, like those in the Fifth Amendment, are more procedural in nature. They're important. We're going to absolutely insist on these things. A lawyer, a jury, the right to confrontation, and a couple of other things. The few core things that are indispensable to any fair trial have to be guaranteed. By saying that criminal defendants can participate in that process, you're evening the playing field just a bit. The government has tremendous resources at its disposal to investigate crimes, to locate witnesses, to interview witnesses, to collect documents, and to use all of that evidence against a defendant to take away the defendant's liberty if the defendant is convicted. But if he doesn't have the right to confront in court and cross-examine the government's witnesses, then he will be at a serious disadvantage. The Confrontation Clause is designed to ensure that uh, testimony doesn't go unanswered, that you don't just hear one version, and it's generally manifested in the right of cross-examination. OK, we've seen cross-examination in a million movies and TV shows. Did your brother have a gun with him? Yes, but I stopped him. Stopped him? Stopped him from what? Oh, he struggled. I took the gun away from him, and then I dropped it. it. It fell somewhere. Was the gun discharged? Was it fired? Well, I don't know. We heard a shot. I don't know. Usually in dramas, the big gotcha moment of truth comes during cross-examination. And here's what that is. One side calls a witness to court to testify under oath because they think what she has to say will help them win their case. She could go to prison if she lies. Testifying in court is a big deal, and the framers thought that it's a big deal that the defendant gets to ask her questions to challenge her testimony. That's cross-examination, and it's so important it's right there in the Constitution, set up by the Confrontation Clause. Cross-examination has been said to be the most important engine for truth-finding. 
And that's what the Confrontation Clause is about. It's seen to be fundamental in, in giving the jury or the judge the opportunity to know whether this witness's story is reliable or not. The jury also needs to be able to assess the intangible factors, whether the person is sweating, whether the person is not making eye contact, whether the person is looking down, whether the person is mumbling, those things that sometimes aren't captured in the cold record, the transcript that a court reporter takes down, but that the jury needs to be there to see. And if we don't have the person come to court and be present, the jury won't be able to assess that. Even if someone's not lying, they could be confused about what they observe. The right to confront that witness is a way of getting at the, the truthfulness of the accusations. So the right to confront or cross-examine a witness testifying against you is absolutely fundamental, but there are some exceptions. Sometimes a witness can't come to court. Maybe he gave a statement, then suddenly died before the trial began. That happens. Sometimes a witness can't be found, or he's in a prison in another state. But what happened over time is that courts started making a lot of exceptions. Live witnesses were being replaced. And in the Supreme Court decision in a case called Ohio v. Roberts, the court said that was okay. Evidence could be introduced against a criminal defendant so long as it was reliable that the Confrontation Clause was really, at its essence, concerned with the reliability of evidence. Reliability. OK. What the heck is that? What's reliable to one judge may not be reliable to another. Reliability was a standard, but it was confusing. Judges all over the country were making decisions about the Confrontation Clause without a clear rule. A bright line rule is a rule that tells judges what to do in a particular situation. An example of a bright line rule in contrast to a, a standard that gives discretion might be, say, a traffic sign that says stop. When you come to a stop sign, you know what to do. You're supposed to stop. As opposed to, say, a traffic sign that says go slow. When you pull up to a sign that says go slow, you have to decide what's slow. Not everybody would agree on what slow is or what's sufficiently slow under the circumstances, but we would all agree what stopping means. When judges use reliability alone as a test without actually seeing the witness, they subject themselves to the same type of problems that all human beings have without seeing the witness. Reading a statement doesn't give them the sense of the person and doesn't let them ask questions about the circumstances under which the statement was taken. So just as Raleigh could not cross-examine or confront a piece of paper, Neither could Michael Crawford. The judge in the Crawford case ruled that Sylvia's testimony to the police was reliable and admitted it as evidence, even though Sylvia couldn't be cross-examined because you can't cross-examine a statement. We don't know what she would say if she took the stand and was cross-examined. Maybe she could explain when she said, I didn't see a weapon, I didn't have an opportunity to see a weapon. I wasn't watching closely enough. There could be all kinds of explanations uh, which would be much less damaging to Crawford uh, than this bold statement, there was no weapon. And if the right to confront a witness was written into the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution, how could you throw it out just by saying a substitute was reliable? That kind of reasoning just had nothing to do with the actual words of the Constitution. So just like we don't say with the, another provision of the Sixth Amendment that the defendant has a right to trial by jury or to a lawyer, and if the judge says, well, you know what, this lawyer you have isn't really going to help you very much. Or having a jury in this case isn't really necessary because I, I can pretty much tell you're already guilty. Uh, we don't dispense with those core constitutional protections, but that's exactly what we were doing with the Confrontation Clause. On November 10th, 2003, Jeff Fisher argued the Crawford case before the United States Supreme Court. He argued that the right to confront meant what it said, that the purpose for the right was to create a clear and fair process and that judges in the lower courts were denying defendants a fundamental right because reliability was a confusing standard. A system of law shouldn't depend on which judge you happen to draw in which courtroom in the courthouse. It should depend on a principle that is applied as even-handedly as possible. Uh, and that's what was not happening. The government argued that sometimes witnesses were not available for trial and that if their testimony was deemed to be reliable, it should be admitted as evidence. Judges should determine what's reliable on a case-by-case -case basis. 
as Jeff Fisher sat in the chamber of the United States Supreme Court and listened to that argument, he was reminded of his research of the trial of Sir Walter Raleigh. I was able to find that transcript uh, of Raleigh's trial. What was amazing is I saw the prosecutor arguing that, oh, Mr. Cobham, uh, his statement is very reliable. The exact kind of arguments that, believe it or not, the court had accepted 400 years later in the Crawford case. Only this time, 401 years after he lost his case, Sir Walter Raleigh's argument won the day for Michael Crawford. On March 8, 2004, the Supreme Court decided unanimously to overturn Michael Crawford's conviction. And it decided by a 7-2 majority to also overturn Ohio v. Roberts and do away with the reliability standard in favor of a bright line rule that defendants have the right to confront witnesses against them in court, just like the Sixth Amendment says. The majority of the court was willing to overturn Ohio v. Roberts because it just frankly thought that Ohio v. Roberts was wrong, that it was wrong as a hist historical matter, that it didn't do justice to what the founders intended when they uh, created the Sixth Amendment. Crawford versus Washington went back to the text and said, let's examine exactly what the framers were concerned with. Justice Scalia wrote the majority opinion for seven of the justices. He drew a line of history starting from ancient Rome to Sir Walter Raleigh. He argued that the framers clearly had Raleigh in mind with the Sixth Amendment. And he took direct aim at the standard of reliability. The rules, he argued, have to be clear so that different judges don't admit or deny testimony in a way that seems arbitrary or deny defendants their Sixth Amendment right. Justice Scalia wrote, dispensing with confrontation because testimony is obviously reliable is akin to dispensing with jury trial because a defendant is obviously guilty. This is not what the Sixth Amendment prescribes. The Crawford decision was really a watershed decision in that it changed how we think about the Sixth Amendment Confrontation Clause. Crawford decided that, no, the right meaning of the clause is entirely different. It's cross-examination that really gives us much better assurance that something is reliable or not. Justice O'Connor and Chief Justice Rehnquist dissented because they thought this was the wrong case to overturn the reliability precedent set by the court in Ohio versus Roberts. But even the Crawford decision acknowledged that there have to be some exceptions to the Confrontation Clause. And in fact, the battle after Crawford between prosecutors and defendants uh, is how far the Crawford doctrine extends. How far does it go? Crawford said that the Confrontation Clause prohibits the introduction of testimonial statements unless the defendant has had a prior opportunity to examine the witness. It didn't define what it means to be testimonial. The cases since Crawford have been trying to flesh out, uh, well, what else is testimonial? Would a person have expected that the statements they were given uh, would be used in a criminal investigation or prosecution? Uh, and if the answer to that is yes, then generally the confrontation clause is triggered. That person would have to come to court and face cross-examination. But the courts are still figuring out what the exceptions are. In other words, who doesn't have to appear in court? Somebody who's making a statement out of court to responding police officers, 911 operators, forensic scientists who are doing analyses and writing documentary reports for the prosecution. And so that's been the primary project since. Where to draw the line is to which of those people and which of those statements the Confrontation Clause now covers. But even with some exceptions, the Crawford case restored the Confrontation Clause and the idea that a fair process is a fundamental right guaranteed by the Constitution. What Crawford said is that there's a particular way that the founders had in mind for us to assess the reliability of evidence. And it was a procedural way which required the evidence to be subjected to cross-examination. The whole point was to say, we're going to identify a few things that are indispensable to a fair trial, and confrontation is one of them. Process is a way for courts to make sure that um, a person accused of a crime is not unfairly convicted of it. If you don't go through this fair process, justice is impossible. The reason that we have the Constitution, the reason we have the Bill of Rights, and all the different laws and protections that create this system is that we define justice by going through that process. 